Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 168. Goodness me. I know. I just realised I hadn't said the episode number for a while, so I thought I'd reintroduce that conceit. And he looked very, very like he needed some input. It was a, well, it to was. That number. It's to that random number. But, 168. Uh, I know, that has no significance whatsoever, but, uh, but here we are. At least it's an even number. I suppose it's, it's got that going for it. But, uh, but yes, this is episode number 168 of the Rewatch Project with Hannah and Mike. Um, what are we talking about tonight, Hannah? We are talking about episode four of season one of Twin Peaks, Rest in Pain. Synopsis says, Cooper meets with Audrey, who confesses to leaving him the note about one-eyed Jacks. Cooper tells Truman he can't remember who the killer was in his dream, but insists the dream is a code to solving the crime. I can see why you struggled that. There were a lot of S's in that, weren't there? Uh, it was directed by Tina Rathborn and written by Mark Frost and David Lynch. It's interesting because, you know, I've said before about how, you know, people forget that, um, you know, David Lynch only directed six episodes of the yeah. original Twin Peaks. Um, but, I mean, he was... He was the director who directed the most episodes of it. You know, mm-hmm. I think I think three was the most. There were a few directors who did three. Um, but, you know, it, it is important to remember that, um, you know, the show was Mark Frost and David Lynch. Um, and certainly David Lynch's aesthetic is the style guide for the show. But it is interesting that there are these other directors and they have really interesting backgrounds because Tina Rathbourne, she was an indie filmmaker. She only made a couple of films. Right. Um, but she made a film in 1988. I remember it being kind of a big deal on the kind of indie film scene uh, called Zelly and Me. And that's notable because obviously that was two years before Twin Peaks. Um, but there's a couple in the film played by David Lynch and Isabella Rossellini, who were a real life oh, couple. Wow. But they, David Lynch, just he just acts in the film. Um, and you see, people forget that David Lynch does act, and even outside, I mean, he's in, um, oh gosh, I can't what it's called now, uh, The Fablemans, the most recent Steven Spielberg film. You know, oh, David he's Lynch. in Twin Peaks as well. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but, 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 but I mean, he acts in things outside of um, his own films. Um, right. So obviously that, that's a connection there with Tina Rathbourne. Well, he's got quite an interesting voice to be an actor. Yeah, yeah, he does. I mean, he's got a persona, but... But it's interesting that the directors, they're for the most part, they're not like TV jobbers that they've just sort of dropped in. Mm. They're often people that Lynch and Frost have already got a connection with. So either indie filmmakers that, that Lynch has worked with or producers or editors or cinematographers on the show who are directing as well. So... You know, they don't get David Nutter in to do any episodes, for example. Well, without or wanting like that. to sound like a wanker, um, they would want to trust uh, whoever's directing with their vision. Yeah. You know, um, and maybe the nut job just wasn't up to the, to oh, the yeah, yeah. Although I think this might even have been too early. I think he was still quite, would have been quite green at that point. But I'll just use him as an example that, you know, that that's the case. But, um, okay, well, we'll get on to that. A couple of quick bits of housekeeping, first of all. Um, I will have, by the time this goes live, I will have posted um, the um, the Sharon and Fenn interview that I mentioned previously. Nice. Yep. Um, so that was an interview that I originally did for the um, Pod Syndicate YouTube channel. Um, but since Noel, a podcasting friend of ours, sort of stepped away from Pod Syndicate, that YouTube channel really has just sort of started gathering dust. Mm. So I thought it would just it was just a bit of a waste to yeah, just have absolutely. that sitting there mm. on yeah. a on a YouTube page that, that nobody points to. Uh, and also obviously we're talking about Twin Peaks and this felt like a good point in the run. It's quite an Audrey centric few episodes around yeah. here. So I thought that that was a good time to do it. So I've put that up there. So um that was recorded about a year and a half ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, just, you know, go and check that out. And, um, there's other little bits of uh, pieces of interviews with Twin Peaks people that I've done over the years that I'll probably pepper in here, uh, whenever possible. Uh, and I have actually, um, today, in fact, um, reached out to a few other people who are involved in Twin Peaks to see if they wanted to maybe, uh, contribute to the show. So I'll, uh, let 
you, Hannah, and the listeners know what comes of that. And uh, maybe <laughs> I was we'll... going to say, have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah just <laughs> took it bomb to off. Um, so um, we'll probably get to, uh, as we did with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, have a chat with some of the people who were uh, um, involved in the show. So that should be interesting. He is hoping. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, we appreciate feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. And if you listen to us on YouTube, then you can leave us comments there. That reminds me, actually, I should point out that the Sharon and Fed interview that I posted is actually a video. Um, but I will also just post the audio of that on the regular audio podcast feed too. Yep. We are on Instagram and Twitter, where in both cases we are at Rewatch Proj. That's Rewatch P R O J. And check out our friend shows, namely Cheerstroker vs. Punter, his film, her movie, Video Game Landfill, Film Bastards, The Good, The Bad, and The Odd, and Talk Without Rhythm podcasts. And also, we appreciate reviews on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. So, do you have any feedback for us today, Hannah? I sure do. All right, here it is. I have an email entitled, Welcome to Twin Peaks. Hello, Hannah and Mike. New listener, Alex, from LA here. Just binge listened to your first three episodes and have to second the thoughts of one of your other feedbackers that I really appreciate your balance of intelligence and irreverence. I have listened to a few Peaks podcasts and they do tend to veer too far towards one or the other. So I will continue listening. I can vouch for that. I have actually rewatched the show recently, so will not be watching along. In fact, I have seen the show so many times, I know it pretty inside out by now. Will you be covering Fire Walk With Me and Season 3? Thanks, Alex. It's funny because thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex, and welcome. It's funny he mentions knowing the show pretty well, and I think one of the reasons why I'm enjoying this rewatch so much is um, it has been a few years. You know, it's been six years since we last watched the show. Yeah. Um. So, and we didn't make it all the way through. Um. So, um, not out of any fault of the show, but we kind of ran out of time when the return, the, the third season started, yeah, we couldn't, which was the reason we, we were re-watching it. And it would just be too weird to be consecutively watching the end yeah. of season two. So I feel like there's been enough time between seeing it again that I'm seeing it with fresh eyes. And, you know, it's so it's been so well remastered and looks mm. so nice that it does feel like a kind of a <laughs> new experience. Um, but no, as far as the questions goes, no, I think we're probably only going to be doing the, the two... Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, the two early 90s seasons. Um, what? Well, that is my understanding. We were just doing the, the you classic. You have not talked to me about this. And no, no. I, 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 have we not been married for 10 years? Do you not know me but at all? <laughs> uh, look, Jennifer, I think I know you very well. But uh, Of course we're going to be doing Fire Walk With Me. And of course we're going to be doing season three. Okay. Because otherwise... We are not doing the complete thing. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, I do kind of see them as two different shows. Well, that is your opinion, and we were not taking yeah, that no, into no. consideration. Oh, no. I, that wasn't me saying this is what we're doing. That was just saying that was what my thoughts were. But um, yeah, your being... thoughts were that you had not in any way um, voiced to me in any way for me to be able to shoot them the fuck down. <laughs> okay. So you heard it here <laughs> first. Uh, and welcome to our podcast, uh, gentle listener. Welcome to our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome to my nightmare. To quote, quote Alice Cooper. Um, welcome to my Stockholm syndrome. No. Um, so um, he does. He does love me. I do love. I, well, yeah, you know this. The listeners know this. Do they? Um, well, they do now. I, I would hope. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll just be popping my the soap in a sock. Uh, <laughs> I like to keep things thematically correct. Uh, I've already been through and checked all the cigarette butts to make sure they're yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, welcome. I'm glad that you are here for Twin Peaks. I hope that you stick around for whatever we cover after Twin Peaks. Um, be, uh, and yes, we will be covering Fire Walk With Me and Season 3 because I think we need to. Yeah. I'd like to, I wanted to cover Fire Walk With Me because um, I've got the extended edition, which I've also, never watched. And also, like you said in the previous podcast, that's Laura's story. Yeah. So I think it's really important to um, to talk about Well, it's it's the it's the three stages of Twin Peaks, and they're all different. I think that mm. the the the, the 19, 1990, 1991 show is one thing. Mm. Fire Walk with Me is another thing, and the third season is again another thing. And it's as though they're all kind of different 
aspects of the same thing. The third season is very dear to me because for a few reasons. Firstly, it was in a world that both of us liked, but I always felt at a disadvantage in the fact that you'd seen the rest of it a lot more than me. Mm. Um, so this was a fresh pair of eyes for both of us, yeah. which was really... Yeah. Neither of us had a clue what was going on. No. <laughs> in fact, in one it? episode, uh, the sound wasn't working on our TV and we thought it was a stylist. Oh, so, yeah, it's a lynching choice. That yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, we watched 20 minutes before we realised that yeah. actually we'll it point probably out the was sequence not the case. when we get to it. And mm. I think listeners will understand why it was actually conceivable. Yeah. That the, uh, um, but also uh, the, the Twin Peaks return was... Um, so our children were three and one at the time. Um, so we were two very in the trenches parents I was extremely sleep deprived our one year old was still breastfeeding at that point Mm. um, and waking up so much in the night Um, so I there were some days I couldn't even drive the car because I was so tired Um, so it was all we had it it was all we had but also like it it was we decided to make a, a thing of it because you know, our kids were little, we don't have babysitters. Um, it was our kind of date situation. So we would put our phones aside, make a real effort to not be distracted watching it. We would engage and talk and, you know, pay attention. And it was like going to the movies together. Um, and, it, it started off a real habit for us of finding, you know, whether it was a rewatch or a first watch, but finding something to engage both of us without our phones, really enjoy the process of it. It was and, also a, it was around then. It, through. it was right after Twin Peaks The Return finished that Star Trek returned to television as well. Yeah, like, and we did the great sci-fi rewatch. Yeah, yeah. So uh, because after Twin Peaks finished, remember I was so sad about the fact that we didn't have something to watch weekly. Yeah. That because we got into such a habit with it, that's when we started watching Next Gen. Yeah. Um, and you know, I for for anyone out there who has got really young kids and you're looking for a way to just have a nice connection with your partner, that's a really good one. Yeah, and Put the podcasting. phone somewhere you can't see it, turn it on to silent and watch yeah. an episode of a TV show together. And, and podcasting is a good extension of that because we're kind of making a meal of it in many ways. Yeah. But um, and it'll be interesting to watch the third <laughs> season again because, you know, we talk a lot on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. about how when you know that something's good or when you mm. know that's where something's going, all of the stress of what's happening. Am I following this? Is this going to be, is it going to be as good as the original? Is it going to be? Yeah. 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 All of that's gone and you can just kind of, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You can just chill out. So, uh, that will be interesting, but okay. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to, um, hit pause. We're going to watch the fourth episode of twin peaks from, um, 1990. Uh, And then we're going to come back. We will give our review reaction, riff on said episode and uh yeah so uh if you want to just hit pause now listeners watch the episode along with us and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it see you soon cs3p combat player one choose your character tired of film and television podcasts where the hosts exist in a blissful state of agreement player two choose your character while you're in luck Punter. round one Allow me to introduce you to the Chinstroker vs. Punter podcast, featuring two film and television fans from Birmingham, England, who enjoy their media in very different ways. <laughs> but anyway, that brings us to the end of the plot of Blue Velvet. The plot. I mean, the main characters are two of the dullest main characters I have ever encountered in any film. <laughs> So join us as we catch up on what we've been watching from our own very different perspectives. Double KO. Round two. Fight. 
You can find us at csvsp.libson.com. Also on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, all the places that podcasts can be found. It just really It's isn't. not visually striking. No. no just, just getting confirmation. It's just in, that's the third time, though. I mean, am I, is this on? Okay, so we just finished watching the fourth episode of Twin Peaks, uh, the episode, uh, at least in Germany, known as Arrest in Pain, um, but known as, rather confusingly, as episode three <laughs> in the rest of the world. Um, and so- also, just before we begin, I got a detail wrong. It was written by Harley Payton. Yes, so th- this is the first episode of the show not to be written by Mark Frost and David Lynch. Um, but really, I guess it's fair to say that... Um, Mark Frost was probably the, the day-to-day showrunner. Uh, the show is essentially run by Lynch Frost Productions, but I think that probably Mark Frost was the one who put the hours in. Mm. And I would say that uh, every episode of the show has at least Mark Frost's fingerprints on it, mm-hmm. um, but it is worth pointing that out, and well-remembered as well. Um, Harley Payton's an interesting guy. He, he would go on to write a lot of episodes of Twin Peaks, uh, and has uh, had a very pretty illustrious career as a uh, writer um, of movies mm-hmm. um, as well. But uh, but yes, yeah, so Hannah, any initial thoughts before we get into the breakdown on this fourth episode of Twin Peaks? I fucking loved it, um, obviously. Well, what well, is not obvious? Uh, <laughs> you well, say that. Well, it is because I've said how much I enjoy Twin Peaks in general. Um, I love. The depiction of Leland's descent into madness, mm. um, and um, yeah, just how everyone's sort of becoming unhinged in their own ways. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, it it's so it's so hard to distill how I feel because I think of one aspect of it and then. 59 other things pop up in my head at the same time. Well, it's it's a show. I mean, one of the reasons why I keep talking about it almost feeling like sketches is the episodes are a collection of moments. Mm, very much so. It's an invitation to love. It is. Yeah, every, every day is the promise of an invitation <laughs> to love. <laughs> um, I absolutely adore the secret signal of the Bookhouse Boys. Yeah. Um, the most overt secret signal in the world. Um, I'm just going to start running my finger down my face <laughs> to you. Um, it just reminds me of our daughter worrying that I'd get mad with her for accidentally pulling the finger. Um, it's got a, a slight whiff of, you know, when you used to pull the finger at your sibling. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. Um, just surreptitiously. Scratch your face kind, yeah, of, uh, yeah. kind of one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love how Audrey's getting fleshed out a little bit in terms of her sneaky little... The Nancy Drew kind of. Yeah, delving into her little secret hideaways to hear what's going on. Well, what's interesting is um, they were going to do a spin-off show Mm -hmm. about Audrey, and it was going to be like a Veronica Mars, Nancy Drew kind Mm -hmm. of show. And... um, that's what Mulholland Drive came from because right, okay. they started coming up with it. And originally it was going to be Audrey was going to go to Hollywood to become an actress mm-hmm. and she was going to get pulled into mysteries. And eventually it never happened. And Lynch repurposed it. And that was what Mulholland Drive came right. from, was originally a an Audrey Horn um, spinoff. Right. And you can sort of see that here. But uh, Yeah. Um, what what were your thoughts? No, I think this is a really interesting episode because this is, and I don't, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but this is the first episode that really feels like an episode of a TV show. Yeah, this is. It's like you often hear about how TV shows will do a pilot. Um, the X Files is a great example of this, where they did the pilot, the, the first couple of episodes, but the network were like, "But how is this going to operate as a show?" Mm. And it wasn't until they did Squeeze, you know, the episode about Eugene Toomes, the stretchy guy, their first Monster yeah. of the Week episode, that the network really bought into the show because they were mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, now we can see how this can actually function as a television show. Yeah. And this feels like that. This feels, although it's still weird and Lynchian and Twin Peaksy, it feels, it's the episode that feels the most conventionally, conventionally 
televisual out of the episodes that have come out so far. Yes. And I think that the show needed that because otherwise, you know, you can't do, like the last episode, you can't do that every week in 1990 mm. and expect people to continue watching the show. You have to have um, and, uh, those lighter elements. And also, I think that this episode introduced a lot of the elements that people think of when they think of Twin Peaks and they're what I always refer to as the cosy elements of Twin Peaks. Mm. So, and they're the elements that would go on to influence things like Northern Exposure. Whereas I think that although people often talk about Twin Peaks as being like you know nightmarish and Lynchian, there's also something very kind of warm and inviting and kind of cosily autumnal about yeah. it. And this is the first episode where you start to see... It's Co- not a summer town. No, but, but, but this is the first episode where you start to see Cooper begin to kind of go native. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is the first episode, because I don't think Lynch was that infer- interested in this element of the show. I think this is something that the other creatives like Harley Payton and Robert Engels and Tina Rathborn and Caleb Deschanel mm-hmm. and uh, Dwayne Dunham and all of those people brought to the show is this idea of Twin Peaks actually being somewhere that you'd want to live. Mm. Whereas I think Lynch had those elements to it, but Lynch's Twin Peaks is a scarier place. Because it's sort of a bit like, well, if you can avoid Bob, yeah. then you'd probably be fine. They've got oh, a nice, yeah. they've got a gazebo. They've got pie. Yeah, 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 exactly. It'd be great. And, and I think Everything's but, made by logs. But, but I do think, though, that this is an important element of the show, and I think it's an important element of the show that was really brought to the show by people outside of Mark Frost and David Lynch. Mm. And I think that this is where the strength of the collaboration of those other people really starts to show. Because when you get people, Twin Peaks fans, who when they're in the Northwest are like, we've got to go to North Bend, we've got to go to Snoqualmie and and go there. Because it's all there. It's still all there. The Double R Diner, the the police station, the high school, the the sawmill. You can go to Twin Peaks and drive around and it Mm. still looks like Twin Peaks. And the reason that people do that is because they kind of want to live in the world of the show. Yeah. And I think that they wouldn't want to live in the world of the show if it was just the pure Lynchian view of it. Mm. So I think that that's worth acknowledging, and this episode brings that. But with that comes a much more traditionally televisual... Like a lot of the the um, Ben Horn, um, Catherine Martell, Josie stuff comes to the fore. There's, like, there's this stuff with um, Norma's husband getting parole... That feels much more like the soap opera elements of the shows that Twin Peaks mm. is parodying coming into the show. But I think that that is kind of important. I mean, and this is the first time we really see Invitation to Love yeah. as well. We saw the logo in a previous episode, but I think that this meta commentary mm. and the thing about Twin Peaks is it's not mocking soap operas. Because it is a soap opera. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that that's mm. one of the. I think that it, that's so much more interesting. Like, if you look at a lot of modern shows that are influenced by Twin Peaks, that are that are a, that go into that much more nightmarish place. So I think of shows like American Gothic and Yellow Jackets and shows like that. I think that it's a lot easier to do stuff that's just purely nightmarish. But balancing that with something as as ridiculous as daytime soap opera, mm. that's a real challenge. Actually, you know? just... On that point, um, I mean, it's near the end, so it's, you know, it is right at the end, actually. Um, The bit where um, Jacoby um, is talking to Cooper in the graveyard. um, I don't know if you felt this, but that, like, his whole speech the way he's talking, the way it's filmed, felt very um, like a 50s film. And mm. I know Russ Tamlin like, is super well known for films around that yeah, sort of Yeah, Seven era. Brides for Seven Brothers. Yeah, yeah. And- um, just I don't know if it's the sound of the speech or the way, the way it's framed, the way it's shot, um, whether the sound, whether the way it was recorded mm. is different, but it really has um, just a, a feeling of a, a like a, a sort of a 40s or a 50s 
love story speech. Well, there's, there's very melodramatic. Mel- I mean? Yeah, it's, it, it's shot like melodrama. There's mm. melodramatic music in there, and one of the things that's interesting is. Into but it's not even of, it's not even the background music. It's it's more like the, the sound, sound, sound recording design, of yeah. the of of his his actual yeah vocals. It's it's, it's very kind of ADR sounding, mm. and the the thing that's interesting that you see a lot in Twin Peaks is because each episode's a day. Often the episodes end at night as we're moving into night. Yeah, and one of the things is they start. They always introduce as soon as you move into night in Twin Peaks. You're already starting to move into the dream world of, of Twin Peaks, mm. and one of the things that they do—it's an interesting technique. Christopher Nolan uses this a lot as well. Is where they'll montage because usually on a TV show, you'll have a scene, and if there's music in it, the music will end as the scene ends, and it will fade to black, and then you're going to the next scene. One of the things that Twin Peaks does a lot, even in the more televisual episodes like this one, and they always do this when you're moving to night, and it creates this sense that you're floating around the town you're almost this kind of omnipotent view of the world and you're mm. going into this person's house and then you're going over here so when you're with you're with Truman sorry you're with um Cooper and Jacoby and you've got the music playing and then it fades into the next scene but the music carries over from the scene before it's mm. the music plays over the same the same backing music plays over three or four scenes so you don't feel like the scene's ending. You feel like you're just moving. So well, it's almost so, like you're the spirit of Laura yeah, watching well, everybody. Well, in the one scene, you've got him talking, and then the dialogue from the next scene starts early, where you hear Cooper just saying, "Do you believe in soul?" And you're like, "Who's he even talking to?" Mm. And then the, the the image moves, and you're like, you realise he's talking to Hawk, and the music from the last scene's carried over. But but they're talking, but you're not seeing them. You're seeing. Leland, mm. and so there's this kind of weird um, perspective mm. almost happening where you, yeah. you do feel like at night in Twin Peaks, reality Very kind of just goes, <clears throat> yeah. but there's a kind of beauty to it. Mm. There's it's it's like. Um, yeah, and so, so I think that, like, secrets... It's not is, always something to be feared, no, I think, no. is what it is. And I think that's the thing, is the fact that, like, you know, David Lynch is very... And I know he didn't direct this episode, but of course, but it is very much from his blueprint. He's very even-handed when it comes to um, light and dark. Mm. You know, it's not like... He's, like, spoiler alert, but, like, the third season of Twin Peaks doesn't have a happy ending, but it doesn't have a sad ending either. It just sort of stops. Mm. And it's almost as though his view is, and this is very much a fine artist's view, is stories don't have happy endings or sad endings. It's just when where you stop watching it. Yeah. Because yeah. so much of what he does, and we'll get into this in season two, is circular. That the end of season three of Twin Peaks, that isn't the end because – you can put the first episode on again afterwards if you want. So mm. it's not – I don't think he sees TV as being this linear thing with a beginning, middle, and end. It's no. just you keep making it, and at some point you stop, and then that's it. I mean, he, you, know? you know, to put a Star Trek reference on it, he's a bit like the um, the celestial beings in DS9 yeah, um, where they don't – Everything is happening all at once. Yeah, like when, always. Like, like like when you are listening to a piece of music, or when you're looking at a painting. A painting doesn't have um, a, a, there's nothing temporal about a painting. It's just mm. there. Yeah, and I think that is the way that David Lynch thinks. It's mm. not as though when season three of Twin Peaks ends, that ending is like a dissertation that's like him saying right that's how it's ending so, end. so that's yeah. how i see it mm. it's like no no that's just where that's just where it stops mm. and but you know it's a modern medium so mm. you can just go back to uh, and it could just it could just as easily have ended on an ecstatically happy moment mm. um, but that doesn't matter yeah you know that's just the kind of thing and it's really interesting and it is relevant you know in the way that this sort of time bending thing is it's season three of Twin Peaks, and I won't talk about specifics, but the penultimate episode of the show felt like the ending. Mm. And then the, the final episode is this whole other thing 
that feels like the beginning of something else. Yeah. And it's almost as though that is just there to send you back to the beginning again. Yeah. To start watching it again. Yeah. <laughs> and to go round again, <laughs> you know. It's, and, and part of that, I think, is the fact that, that the primary genre influence on Twin Peaks is the soap opera. Mm. And soap opera, as a form of storytelling, resists closure. Oh, soap operas 100%. shouldn't end. Dallas should just go on forever until they stop making it. Well, you think about you know? things like Coronation Street, yeah. which has been going since the 60s, yeah. it, with the same things it's, it, happening it's, to different it's, people. It's not designed to have closure. No. And I, so I think that's an element to it. So and I no think, one is designed to be... It, it, like have a, a, a just a, a happy ending that lasts forever. Well, how could you even meaningfully end something like that? You know, because well, that's not life. Well, it's like famously, Mark Frost and David Lynch said that they never wanted to reveal who killed Laura Palmer. Yeah, that that was just there to bring you into the town. So that there mm-hmm. tells you that they're not interested in closure. No. They're just interested in the storytelling opportunities. I mean that that provides. It, it's amazing. I even like it, considering how much I need closure. No, but in a weird way, though, that's where the sketch element of it is. Is that every scene in Twin Peaks is a movie? You get like twenty pieces of closure. Yeah. Every episode, it really is just a matter of perspective, you know, and how you measure that. I think that viewing all. it as a, a series of sketches is is a really good way to look at it because. It's so dense. That well, that's one of the reasons yeah. why I, I'm a big defender of that run of episodes in season two, where they obviously, you know, they've got they've got pressure to prematurely end the Laura Palmer storyline, mm. and they didn't have time to foreshadow the next kind of big bad, so to speak. So, so they put James and Donna so, forefront. So, so there's, there's a couple of episodes where it's flading, but but one of the reasons why I defend those episodes so much is. The thing that saved the show creatively for me is that that sketch element, mm. that sketch show element, because those episodes really are just this fun run of episodes where you really just get a sense of the flavour of the town. Yeah. You know, pure soap opera. You know, those, the Norma and Ed storylines and things like that come to the fore. Yeah. Uh, and I love that shit, so I'm fine with it, you know. And, and what is interesting as well, just to sort of before we get into the breakdown, just to connect back to the whole idea of the mystery, is obviously this is the rewatch project, and one of the big parts of the engine of Twin Peaks was who killed Laura Palmer. Mm. Now, what amazes me, well, it doesn't amaze me actually, because I've, I've rewatched the show so many times, is how little knowing who kills Laura how little that actually negatively affects enjoyment of watching the show. Yeah. And it makes you realise, actually, how unimportant that really is mm. and how well, David the show Lynch, is about so much more than that. Well, David Lynch and Mark <clears throat> Frost were right, mm. is the fact that the the idea that maybe you'll find out who killed Laura Palmer to keep the audience watching and maintain that sense of mystery in the background, the kind of the uber mystery at, in the, at the centre of, like, all of these hundreds of other sort of meta mysteries... Mm. Um, was there, and I think that when, um, you know, the Bob Iger, uh, who was running ABC at the time, said to them, "Look, you you have to. This is a, an order, basically. Reveal it." They the fr- what they're called the Killer Bob. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's funny because they um, they um, Lynch famously said that they killed the Golden Goose. Yeah. When they did that. Um, and it was funny because Bob Iger, who obviously he, he was the CEO of Disney now, mm. has been, you know, he oversaw the purchase of Star Wars and uh, of Lucasfilm and of Marvel and all the, you know, Pixar, mm. all this big stuff. I, I for just be, recently finished reading his um, autobiography because right. he retired um, and then got called back to Disney about a year ago because the person who took over just fucked it all up. And... In his autobiography, he says that that's one of his biggest regrets of his professional career. Right. He said he, he, he was like, I was wrong. He's yeah. like, he's like, he said he was always worried. He said he admired David Lynch as an artist, but felt he didn't know how to run a show. Mm. Um, and that it was basically like, you know, your hippie shit is great and all, but you've got to be a manager when you're a showrunner as well. Yeah. But he said he had a lot of he had a lot of faith in Mark Frost. Yeah. But he said that look, 
you're cheating the audience. They want to know. You can't not tell them that. And he basically said that um, he was really wrong and that um, he uh, actually, like many, many years later, apologised to David Lynch for making <laughs> making that decision. And he said that it killed the show. It, it's what killed the show. Mm. You know, the show would have run forever. It would have run for 11 years, mm. you know. if and, and Lynch and Frost would probably have gone and it would probably have just become Northern Exposure or something yeah. like that. But in another world, it'd be really interesting to see where Twin Peaks had gone if it had just ran through the whole through mm. the nineties. Yeah, you know. But uh, well, well it'd you, be very like the X Files, probably. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it would sort of have just become very well, just in that in that sense that, um, you know, the conceit of Mulder looking for his sister, even though I'm sure that. You know that has resolution. You know, um, I'm only on season five. Yeah. Um, but um, it does, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, that doesn't surprise me. But in some ways, it's sort of irrelevant. Um, yeah. To to the show, to the enjoyment of the show. Well, they can come up with another thing. It's not like <laughs> sometimes you do get these shows where that um, MacGuffin is so central to the concepts of the show that they can't answer it. The example I always use of that is Star Trek Voyager. Mm. Because if they find their way home, that's, it. that's the done. show. Yeah. The entire conceit is gone. Yeah. Um, whereas like, I wouldn't say that the entire conceit of Twin Peaks was who killed Laura Palmer. No. I think the entire conceit of Twin Peaks is um, there's some weird shit going on in this town. Mm. Basically, and, or in, and in a town like Twin of, Peaks, nobody's innocent. You know, that's and, the yeah, nobody's innocent, and also, um, and they sort of allude to this in this episode. You know, the town is very other in terms of how it's touched by the rest of the of the country and the world. Yeah, yeah, and they they um, they they have a conversation about that in this yeah. episode, don't they? I mean, yeah, and and <clears throat> how they like it that way. So it, it, it's a lot about um, kind of stopping those exterior forces and from modernity. taking over, or also seeing what the natural elements of Twin Peaks do to combat exterior forces. And, and, and I, what I would say, I won't say too much about it now, but I would say that that's very much what season three is about. Yeah. Season three is about <clears throat> um, what... The, I guess it's about the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's about nothing, Jerry. But it's it's the fact that you know the, the, when we talked about this last week, you know, just the idea of a sawmill mm. of bringing machinery in that is killing trees. Yeah, you know, and um, how it's almost too late. Yeah. They've gone too far now, and in season three, that's you really see what happens when goodness and purity leaves a place yeah um and how you know can that be saved well should, should we get into the um the breakdown yes absolutely okay. so we open up uh, on this episode with audrey and cooper mm-hmm. in the great northern uh and like you, you mentioned earlier on um audrey is very much in uh nancy drew mode you mm-hmm. know she's very much she's trying to impress cooper uh, and the thing is, I, I still maintain... She's got that, the old fizzy knickers for him. Well, well the thing is, I, I don't think she has. I, I think... No, she likes She's. Uh, she likes the idea of him, I think. I, I think she just... There's just several things going on with Audrey. There's, first of all, there is the daddy issues, obviously. Mm. That, that she wants the approval of a father figure. There's yeah. that. But I think also, it's just that she doesn't know who she is. You know, she's grown up a rich kid mm. uh, who's been pampered. And I think that she's got to the age now where she wants something for herself and she wants almost to, it's the adult world. She wants mm. the promise of the adult world. Like, you know, the idea of, of black coffee. Yeah. You know, the idea of um, having, looking into mystery. And it's a lot like, it's like Jeffrey in Blue Velvet, you know, mm. peeking through, you know, the, the, the slats in the wardrobe yeah. of the adult world, you know. How old is she supposed to be in this? Um, I think she's supposed to be 16 or 17, 17 maybe. Right. So, no, 17 or 18. She's, in the, she's just finishing high school. Right. So, sort of however old that is. But um, 
so we see she mentions the the jack with one eye and talks about how it's a casino and it's funny as well because in some ways she's actually more clued up than cooper because she's like yeah she's like um um women work there and he's like well what do men do and she's like she's she's almost like i'm a young friend she's like you know men go there Mm. and you know so it's almost as though no, she says men go there, and he says, "What do?" Oh women yeah, yeah, do? women, yeah, yeah. But 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 her reaction to him, she is slightly like, "Oh bless you," you know. Yeah. And he's he's playing a bit of a game with her as well. But there is such purity to Cooper. You know? I, no, I sort of saw that more as I'm going to see if she knows. Um. Oh okay. yeah, well, you, know, you know, like you know, absolutely. He, like he, I don't, I he, don't. He could, no, he could be either. But what I'm talking about though is Audrey's reaction. Mm. You know, Audrey sees Cooper as being so angelic. She even mm. says in a later episode that he's perfect. Mm. You know, and so I think that he says a lot about how she perceives him. But she's, and I mean, of the fact that she salutes him as well for something. It's almost like a girl guide. Of course, and Colonel Colonel Cooper. Yeah, yeah, mm. and. um but also, it is you get the, the impression that she's she is probably used to even at that age understanding how to sort of use her sexuality um, on men, yeah, and or, almost as though she suspects that Cooper would want her to be the plucky girl guide kind of type yeah. because he's so he's such well, a wholesome. She's in that he's a boy scout. phase of her life. Yeah. Where, she doesn't know herself well enough, so she's going to be whatever she thinks someone yeah, else Yeah, she's trying on all these faces to see which mm. one takes, you know? I mean, it's like turning up to the funeral with the slick down here. Like, uh, should I be more sophisticated, mm. you know, um, rather than should girly? Should I pull beard out myself? Yeah. <laughs> Super sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. Steve is sexy. <laughs> so she mentions um, the perfume counter. So yes. all of these things are starting to coalesce. We see Harry and Lucy go to see Cooper, and I love I love all of the the bits of business with food in this episode as well, where Cooper's talking about um, having pancakes and ham. Mm. And he's like, "Was it nothing beats for taste sensation when maple syrup collides with ham?" <laughs> you know, it's just the sort of the physical. Joie de vivre that I, you demonstrate. I sort of feel like you have Cooper's joie de vivre. For food. <laughs> yeah, but not his metabolism, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> no one has that metabolism. Yeah. Well, and also because he's like, you know, in his late 20s. And, uh, <laughs> I am not. Yeah, we all had that metabolism in our late 20s. Exactly. I remember when I was in my 20s, um, cutting down to just one Kit Kat a day, and I lost. Like half a stone. I know. Yeah, so, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, like now, you like you you cut down to like one grain of rice a day, yeah, and uh, and I still put on a kilo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he tells them about the um, the dream, and he and he basically verbalizes what we talked about in the last last episode, which is um, break the code, solve the crime, and this is a pattern the show has, where you'll get these episodes that Lynch will direct, and they'll be full of really dense symbolism mm. and then the next episode is like the characters in the show kind of unpacking it yeah and kind of making sense out of it so and, and that you get the feeling that there's a there's a point in the show where it's really firing on all engines where unspokenly they realize that mm. where Lynch will just come in and be kind of like will just ideate and then the show itself will narrativize those ideations into mm. actually being you know a plot um, so, um, I, I love the fact that, um, they, cause they, they do a bit of a previously on Cooper's dream thing where he's talking about it, but I love that when he says that he can't remember how Truman's like, damn, and Lucy's like, damn. But the thing I love about it is the fact that A, they actually were buying into it mm. to the point where if he had said that in his dream he'd have found out how, they'd be like, well, that must mean they killed them. Th- yeah. they're, they're, they're that in yeah. the Cooper zone. Yeah, and um, no one goes, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, but, and just, but just how sort of gee whiz they yeah. are. I mean, particularly Truman, because I think Lucy's just copying whatever Truman oh, says. Yeah, you know? Lucy's um, just, uh, yeah, taking minutes. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I love, I love it. The thing was it in season three where her story arc He's trying to figure out how mobile phones work. <laughs> and like in the last episode, she's like, I understand mobile phones. <laughs> like she can't get that like somebody can be 
walking towards her and talking to her on the phone. And it's just this, <laughs> and um, but but the 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 wholesomeness again of that kind of relationship. And I think that this this being the episode that kind of um, cutifies Twin Peaks a little bit. Yeah. Um, that will go on to be part of the appeal because I think that the thing about Twin Peaks is he's got all these disparate elements. And I think with, with if any one of those disparate um, elements would be gone, the show would be less. Yeah. And it would be less interesting because, and that's why I think the collaborative elements of it are so important. Because I think if it was just the Northern exposure, oh, look how cute this town is and this big city FBI agents come to this town and, it's, and he learns to like it. That would have been nice for a few episodes. Mm. Um, but then, you know, that kind of local hero kind of thing. Mm. Um, and then, but also conversely, if it was just grim, you know, Sarah Palmer screaming and, you know, Bob murdering people yeah. and freaky stuff going on in the woods. Leland trying to dance with everyone. Yeah. That would just be one note and exhausting. It's the kind of the the relationship between mm. those things and the coexistence of those Shelley things. Shelley being hit with the sock and so. Well, yeah, it's it's the it's the sheer variety of stuff. Mm. But even in like, um, I mean, Fire Water Me is just bleak the whole way. It is bleak, but, yeah. But season three has that balance as well, where mm. there's actually quite a lot of funny stuff in it mm. as well. Um, but again, it's it's it, it, it can turn. Yeah. Really quickly. Yep. And you know, it makes the funnier stuff more welcome and funny. It makes mm. the emotional stuff it's more a pellet cleanser. Yeah. Well, you feel like you've earned it. When mm. there's a beautiful moment, it means more. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is an interesting thing. Bit of a geeky one. Is did you notice that there was stuff that Cooper mentioned about his dream that you didn't see? Like he talks about how Andy and Lucy were in the dream. Yes. And he talks about how Mike shot Bobby and about how Andy did a sketch of Bob Mike and all this. Bob. Yeah, sorry, yeah, Mike shot Bob. And the reason for that is that's all stuff in the version of the dream that you see in the European version of the pilot. And oh, I said okay. the pilot had that. Yeah. So obviously what happened is that when they wrote this episode, they obviously hadn't finished editing the show and they'd obviously just been given the version of the dream from the end of the mm. European version of the pilot. So it's really interesting, and maybe at some, at some point I'll show you that version. Mm. It's only about a 10 minutes a sequence, but it's all stuff that it's really interesting when you watch it because it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff that isn't in the show that's really fascinating and does mm. kind of inform you. So, it, But it is, a, it is one of those weird things like, you know, the comic book adaptation of Star Wars has got scenes in it that weren't in the film because the person who wrote the comic book had the shooting scripts yeah. and the film hadn't been edited. It's one of those kind of things. Um, but I, that always always occurs to me whenever I watch this. Um, we get a fight at the morgue mm. um, because Albert is being a bit of a douchebag. There's there's loads of great dialogue Albert from Albert Schwarzenegger. in this. Uh, sorry, Albert Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's there's lots of great dialogue from him in this. Like he, I love the bit where he's like, like you, you've got no, was it, you've got no empathy, and he's like, I've got empathy coming out of my nose. He's <laughs> like, I'm a sultan of sentiment, <laughs> and. Um, and I've always there's one odd choice in this in this scene as well. How fascinated Ben Horn looks with Laura's court. Yes, I I noticed that as well. And, and he's it, like he's really staring at her up close. But I almost get the impression that it's designed to. And there's a bit of meta knowledge here because of, I know what happens later in the show. Is I think it is that he is genuinely saddened that she's dead. But he's not used to feeling humanity. You see, I, 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 I didn't it take it as that at all. I took it more as he was looking almost like an anthropologist, um, like, oh, here's this dead person, and and I really should be sad about this. And let me like, I, I like just as as an alien. Well, well, no, no, well, I mean, it's funny because we're, we're both saying the same thing, but we're just perceiving it differently. Because mm. what we're both talking about is he's viewing her with a kind of fascination. But uh, my feeling is my my, and I think this is completely ambiguous. I don't think there's any mm. way of no, saying this was right. You want but to. the way I interpret it is, I think that his fascination is in his own response. Respond. I think his fascination is in how it's making him feel. Mm. 
I think that you he's, see, whereas I don't think he's feeling anything. Yeah, yeah, and I think he is. I think I do think that Ben Horn as a character does have hidden depths, and I think they do reveal themselves as the show goes on. Um, but but I think that in that moment, but I think it was an interesting choice to actually. Present I, th- that. I think he, I think he has hidden depths, but I don't think at this point. Those steps, I think he's still as shallow as a puddle at this point. I think for the most part he is, yeah. Um, I like the way that he's meant to be there to represent the family. And I love the way that he goes all politician and he's mm. like, yeah. And I love the way that Albert deals with me. He's like, look, Mr. Horn, I understand that your position in this town uh, affords you uh, a certain uh, irritating way of expressing yourself and like, you know, just completely like tears him a new one. Obviously, um, Harry comes in and punches him with what, the old rustic sucker punch as uh, Albert calls it, eventually, you know, getting to go. But I, I also, one of the, my other favourite character beats, is, and this is something that Twin Peaks does really well, is these little moments that you wouldn't get in a normal TV show because it would already have faded out, is when he takes Laura's hand and places it back mm. on her because she's fallen. Yeah. And it's just the fact that he has enough of a sense of humanity for a dead person mm. to sort of be like, no, she deserves to... You know, she's got no she, agency over she herself. She needs to have dignity. Yeah, yeah, exactly, mm. yeah. And what you're seeing there is an early example of Cooper wanting to not only solve Laura's murder, but save her in some way. Mm. And I think that's what he is discovering more and more, is how little dignity she had afforded to her in life. Yeah, she wasn't even a person. She was a photograph, you know. She was a photograph. She was she was kind of a conduit for other people yeah. to live through yeah. in lots of different ways, whether, and it's like, it, whether it's Jacoby or, um, you know, the the autistic boy or whoever, you know, they yeah, all yeah, have learning, their own experiences. Learning, yeah, Josie learning English from her. Yeah. But, um, but you get the – I think the only other person who understands that is Bobby. Mm. He's the only other person who can see through, who actually sees Laura, knows she was a person, and and kind of acknowledges his own his own compl- part to play. Well, her death has has been the first step in him growing up, and I think that's why we keep getting these scenes with mm. him and his father because I think we're going to see a journey for Bobby mm. of actually maybe he will start listening to his dad a little bit. Mm. And maybe that will actually start to have an impact on his life. Yeah. And it's interesting that he's one of the characters that we follow quite closely in the third season. Yeah. And, you know, so again, this is this is the first time I've gone back and rewatched the show, knowing where a lot of these characters are going to end up in 25 years' time. Mm. So it's really informing. That circular narrative is really starting to kind of fold back on itself and inform, yeah. you know, where, where these things are going. There's a reason why we're getting all of these scenes with Briggs trying to impart his wisdom on, on this son. I love, he just, he's I love too that young he's to hear it. He's got yeah. the best voice. <laughs> and um, so we um, we see Chet on uh, Invitation to Love. Chet. Woo, um, woo. <laughs> Chet. I, 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 just, I only can hear the Alan Partridge version of that now. Chat. <laughs> um, so um, I, I love I love Invitation to Love. I wish I could remember the characters' names because they're amazing. But it's the way it's like. There's one girl. It's like as Emerald and Montana, and yeah. it's the way he writes to his daughter. He's like to my daughter Emerald and Montana. It's like what? So are they the same person? But like, this this show makes no sense. Like, um, but we we see so we see Leland, and this is a really important scene actually, as far as the the kind of meta elements of the show because we see um the tv show first of all foreshadowing what's going to happen in the show you know you're talking about that classic soap opera trope of the doppelganger mm. you know the um the character in disguise or the secret child or the, yeah. the twins and all this and that's as we're introduced to maddie who of course is played by cheryl lee mm. um and she's one of many doppelgangers that will appear in david lynch films you know we'll yeah. see that again in more Holland Drive, we see that with the two characters, one blonde, one brunette in Lost Highway. Uh, and ultimately it all goes back to Vertigo, the Alfred Hitchcock film, mm. you know, the Kim Novak character uh, who, you know, comes back from the dead, but as a different woman. And this idea of, um, the, of the dead woman returning, but with in a different guise is something that clearly is a fascination to David Lynch. Yeah. But also 
it's one of those tropes that exists both in high culture, mm. in things like Vertigo and in European cinema, but also in low culture, in Days of Our Lives and, you know. Oh, um, absolutely, you know, the, the Young and the Restless. Yeah, yeah, and, and Melrose Sons Place. and, the, and Yeah, yeah. So I think it's interesting that, of course, that coalesces with Twin Peaks itself doing that, mm. you know, and having this character. And also I think part of it is just that I think that they want they – Wanted to bring Cheryl Lee into the show, you know? yeah, absolutely. Like they, they 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 cast her as this corpse, not mm. knowing that because she just you know was a beautiful woman, mm. and they you know were like okay, but obviously what they realised and what Fire Walk with Me will show is she's a tremendous actress as well. She is, yeah. Um, so I think that, and, and I think also from a subtextual perspective, it continues this idea of Laura. Still being there, yeah. Because while she didn't have agency over her, her own life, she's now haunting the town, mm. um, and everybody's dirty laundry, and you know everything is coming. I mean, Leo has literally got dirty laundry. He you know? does. But um, but a clean house. So there's uh, It's really it's quite frustrating to me how unfinished that house is. Like, dude, fucking hurry up, man. Mm. And uh, it really can't be that secure because basically half of it is plastic sheeting. I think when you've got Leo Johnson living in your house, uh, you don't have to worry about no the outside world it. too much. No, no. <laughs> and also, I mean, he he lives, they live right on the, they're, they're, they're probably as close to living in the woods mm. as any character. So I almost feel like Leo is this kind of interstitial character between just the wild, the wildness of the woods mm. and the civility of the town. Yeah. You know, he's this kind of... He, he could probably exist in both worlds just about yeah. if he had to. And the fact that the house itself is half outside as well, mm. it almost feels like... It, it's, like a, it's, a, it's another liminal space. It's another one of those places where it yeah. feels like if you just walked into the wrong room, you'd suddenly end up in Narnia, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, the, or, or in, you know, the Red Room. Um, so uh, we get the scene with um, about Hank um, and the parole officer goes to see Norma, and I, I love the fact that when she, and Peggy Lipton is so great, she's so tough. Um, you know the way that this guy is getting a bit greasy and a bit oily with her, like oh, you know you're a, you're an incredible woman. You know what do you say to all these you know Jack the lads? And she's like, oh, I usually tell them that I have a homicidally jealous husband um, who's doing you know 15 years for manslaughter. But expects to be a productive member of society real soon. Three to uh, five, she's uh, yeah. Like, but, but but and then the guy just he's like, right, okay, sorry, mm. I'll just go there. But I, I just love that sequence. So we see ducks on the lake when Cooper and Truman go to see Leo, and he's so he's so delighted by them. Like I, part of me wished that there were little ducklings so that he could go, baby ducks. <laughs> um, he's. Uh, yeah, like it's right up there with the pine trees for me. For yeah. um for how excited and pie. Yeah. So um so we see Bobby and his dad, um, and he's telling him, you know, not to be afraid. And the thing that I love about this scene is the fact that, you know, you get all of the Don Davis, you know, great dialogue stuff. But just when Bobby finally kicks off and he's like, I'm not scared, I'm gonna tear it up, it's just how nonplussed the mummies. Yeah. And she walks, she's like Hi, so is, uh, are, we, are we ready to go? Are ready to go? <laughs> and it's just like you get the impression she's just got so good at just blocking out yeah. and just smiling through the pain. And just so used to it. Like it's obviously a very common occurrence for that to be the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But she just kind of has to. Um, the w- One element of Two Peaks that I think has aged a little bit roughly are things like the idea that like Hawk is like a tracker. Oh, Because like yeah. he's a native. And there's some stuff later on around Chinese culture with Oh, Josie. yes. And it's a funny one because on the one hand, Twin Peaks does exist in this genre satire space. Mm. So there's that. But also, I think that when the show does that, I don't think that there's anything sort of malicious. It no. almost It's almost a kind of innocence mm. thing. But it's, it is worth mentioning, you know, yeah. the idea that, oh, of course, the Native American guy is the tracker. He's going to be able to track um, someone down. But then way. again, you know, Cooper is an, is an absolute cliche of an FBI agent. Yeah. Um, 
And like Truman, he's an absolute uh, cliche of like the, the small town sheriff. So, mm. but when you start getting into tropes based around culture and ethnicity, um, in modern to modernize, there are moments where you're like, yeah, you wouldn't do it like that now. Would no, you? exactly. Yeah. So we get the update from Albert, uh, and we, this is where we start to understand um, the sometimes my arms bend back moment. Yeah. And what this is, I think, telling us is that. It's almost reassuring the audience that this weird stuff isn't just weird stuff, you know. No, that, that, that it is going to inform the actual events yeah. of the murder. Yeah, mm. and, and whether that was the intention when those scenes were made, mm. or whether it is just them, the, the people making the show, um, figuring it out after the facts. Who knows? Mm. And I think that in some cases it's one, in some cases it's the other. But I think that. There are things where um, it's not just all like whoa. Let's uh, it's not jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So um, we Alba asks Cooper to sign the bit of paper talking about the uh, the assault, and this is where um, you know we get a little bit of that kind of you know local hero thing of uh, Cooper talks about how you know the impact of crime in Twin Peaks is different, and how the, the, it's a small uh, community and the the dignity that they've shown and you know Albert makes fun of him for I, that but I think it's a reassuring scene in the sense that it shows that uh Cooper means what he says like he's not just paying lip service to the sheriff and and yeah to lives, ingratiate you know, himself to, yeah exactly to ingratiate himself he means it and is willing to uh piss other people off or, you know, yeah. stand up Hurst for himself. professional relationship. Yeah, just to, to get his point across. Like, he he's he's never going to – he's he's not a person who's going to lie. No. Um, yeah, and I, I love that about him as a character. Yeah. Really jumps out at me this episode that I've never really paid much attention to before. And I think this is one of the great things about doing the rewatch. It's, it's a little bit like – going back and listening to an album that you haven't listened to for a long time and realise that there might be a track on there that you've been kind of sleeping on a little Mm. bit, is I really like the scene between Ed and Nadine just before the funeral. Yes. Where, like, she's, like, obviously, like, not well. Like, she doesn't even recognise her own nephew. No, yeah. And she's talking to Ed about, you know, how... She's really happy because of, you know, presumably because of her breakthrough of the drapes, which are this, you know, mm. this one thing that she's kind of, this thread to reality that she's mm. been keeping. And, um, you know, she talks to Ed about how she remembers, uh, you know, when he was like the quarterback mm. and, uh, you know, Norma was like, you know, the, the head of the cheerleaders yeah. and how jealous she was and how much it meant to her that she, that he settled for her. Mm. And, you know, but it's how um, Everett McGill plays the scene. You can just see the con- how conflicted. It's the heartbreak on his face. Yeah. Like, it's that uh, sort of sad realisation that he can't leave he her. He can't leave her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a combination of pity and, and love for her. Yeah. It's um, not that he doesn't love her. But, but also knowing that he'll never have Norma. No. They, 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 they just can't. Like happiness is not going to be his. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and and it's all there on his face mm. in the scene is, as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's... He's wonderful. He's such a wonderful actor. Yeah, yeah. I really well, enjoy well, him. Well, he's like an old school, like Western actor mm. in the way that he's one of those guys where, you know, back when, in, when films didn't have a lot of dialogue and you just had to kind of Mount Rushmore it, you he's, know? I, I find him quite an interesting actor in, in that his face can look completely different depending on his emotion. Like, it, it, like it's almost like his eyes change shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which, yeah, it's, it's interesting watching him act. Yeah, it's I a like very it. old school kind yeah. of way of acting, you mm, know. It's sort really of good. John Wayne, Sam Elliott kind of, uh, kind of thing. I love the way that when James comes in, he's like, I can't go to the funeral, I just can't do it. And it's almost like he's like, I just... I just feel too much, you know, man. You know, it's like I can't. The, the amount of poetry this is going to generate. Yeah. <laughs> if I go, it's like I just don't have enough pens to get through. 
Ryan Adams hasn't even released the <laughs> yeah, album yeah, yeah. yet, man. He's got I'm a jumper just... big enough to get over my knees when I uh, <laughs> when I'm after this. Yeah, jumper over the knees. So um, perfect. So we go to the funeral. I love the funeral sequence here because it was, um, although this episode isn't directed by David Lynch, the funeral is almost the quintessential Lynch scene. I in love the way that... watching Cooper watch everybody. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. what, what, what I mean by that is that one of the things that Lynch loves to do is to have a scene where it's a really formal situation and then it just goes to shit. Mm. Like I think of like in Eraserhead, there's a great dinner scene where um, Henry goes around to his girlfriend's house to meet her family for the first time and just mad shit starts happening. Mm. Like the, the, the turkey that they've got on the table starts coming to life and just insane stuff. And this feels like one of those. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like... And Leland jumps in. Yeah, it's you've got like, like Johnny oh Horn God. starts shouting and then yeah. Bobby kicks off and it's just... Johnny Horn, to me, is is just the toddler, you know. I mean, when our son was, uh, he would have been three, I had to take him to a funeral and he was a fucking nightmare. Um, <laughs> at that funeral, he was... Going, look, it's a frog, and oh, it's a turtle, <laughs> you know, all this kind of thing. And you know, Johnny is the one, you know, hey man, hey man, <laughs> you know, I, it just had toddler energy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is probably the one time when we have most of the cast together. Yeah, you know, I don't think this is probably the largest gathering of cast members, probably in the whole run of the show. I'd mm. imagine, and um. But then it goes mental, you know. We've got uh, it kicks off between Bobby and and Bobby kind of takes the town to task for the hypocrisy of it. Yeah. You know the fact that you know everybody knew she was in trouble. All you good people, um, James kicks off because I think he's just angry at Bobby for ruining it. You know, mm. uh, and then you know Leland goes mad as well, and Sarah kind of is just like, oh, you know, don't ruin this too. And it's funny because... I love that because it, it sort of signifies, again, all is not well. Don't ruin this as, as well. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it is funny because obviously there is a humorous element to that. And I like the fact that they always do pull back on that. Like at the end of the episode when Leland is trying to get everyone to dance, mm. I think a lesser filmmaker would have gone for the cheap comedy moment and had like maybe Cooper dance with him yeah. or something. But... They find the humanity in the moment, and the mm. humanity is it's almost like the drunk guy in the bar. They're kind of yeah. like, let's just get you back to back to bed, mate. Yeah. You know, uh, and and they sort of take that approach. But yeah, so so it's and and then we get um, you know Shelley just really meanly taking the piss out of it in the uh, yeah. <laughs> in the diner afterwards, and um, and and it's funny because you you see locals who aren't cast members as well, just assorted old folks who were sat at the... a little giggle. Yeah, and it kind of it adds a little bit of colour and flavour yeah. to the town to see these sort I of... I like, think you, know, you need that for Shelley as well, to remind yourself that she is, like, having it off with Laura Palmer's boyfriend. Yeah, she's a young yeah. girl. She Yeah, she is a young who, like, girl. Who married some asshole because he had a cool truck. Yeah. And he's now dating another asshole. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and in, spoiler alert, in the third season, dumps him. For an even bigger asshole, it's like, you know, some people are just stupid. Yeah, some people are just asshole magnets. Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, an asshole magnet. <laughs> there's a, there's a problem. That quite a sell. magnet. We get quite, I guess, in many ways, a pretty important scene where we see Hawk, Ed and Harry meet Cooper. And they've called him in. And that's the great moment where he's like, um, this is where pies go when they die. It's another moment of food fetishism. And I think that the, the placement of that in this episode, again, is another one of these solidifying kind of cosy elements. Mm. But what they talk about is that somebody's pushing drugs into Twin Peaks and Cooper's a bit concerned that Ed is there. He's like, is there like, is this like vigilante justice going on mm. here? But what they say to him is, is that, you know, one of the great things about the town is it's away from the world, but there's a dark side to this. And they, they start to allude to this presence in the woods. Yeah. And that there's a history, mm. that the generationally this thing has gone on. Um, so this is the show really f beginning to move into this, actually, is there something yeah. really, supernatural going yeah, on Yeah, it is that supernatural you know? element. 
is this like a stealth genre show uh, yeah. at this point? Mm. Harry talks about how we've always been here to fight it, and it's the Bookhouse Boys, you know, this secret society of you know Shit men, ass you know. Signal. Yeah, and, and it's this idea of torches in the darkness. One thing I was thinking is is they always do the signal in front of the the bad guys. Like, wouldn't that be a, a bad idea to do the signal? Reveal themselves, yeah. yeah. It's secret. Uh, so they've got um, Bernard Renault, one of the um, what will turn out to be many Renault brothers. They tip off Jacques Renault, who's one of the bartenders at the roadhouse, who is involved in this drugs racket or conspiracy or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. We see that Shelley's bought a gun. We get a uh, bit of business Shelley's between... Bought a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Was that era as well? Uh, Josie and Truman talk about um, Catherine and Benjamin. And, uh, there are so many, like, secret compartments in that house. I know. <laughs> it's like, imagine if you like you lost your keys, you'd be like, oh, God, it's going to take me weeks. <laughs> like, you have to go through all the compartments. And there's probably some I don't even know about. We get the scene between Jacoby and Cooper at Laura's grave. Uh, and I love the way that it merges into, we talked earlier on about the sort of philosophical conversation yeah. between Cooper and Hawk uh, about soul. And uh, Hawk talks about how he believes in many souls. and Many are uh, souls. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Dear <laughs> 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 idea. About how, uh, but I love the way though that I mean, and this is to sort of push back about what I said about this idea of you know the spiritual Native American. Mm. Is he just become pragmatic? Like they're getting quite deep, and you know they've got having. You see, Cooper was drinking a beer, which you mm. don't see very often. You know, his ties a bit loose. You know, um, it's not, rocking out. Uh, <laughs> he's rocking out with you know what out. And um, but when he does get philosophical, and you know he talks about this, you know, the land of the dead, and. Um, this wandering spirit, and Cooper's like, um, do you think that's where Laura is? Mm. Hawk's like, Laura's in the ground. Mm. That's all I know. So I like the fact that the show does pull back yeah. from just this assumption that he's like super spiritual to, to well, I, well, the only thing I know for sure is that she's dead, mm. you know? And um, the the that's where we see, um, you know, Leland having his little episode and, then they take him home. But I like... I suppose that's like the lawmaker side of him coming out. Like he's a, he, he might be, you know, Native American, tracker, extraordinaire, but he's also a policeman yeah. who deals in evidence and fact. But I, I do like the fact that the episode ends on kind of a quiet moment. And that's the other thing as well is that it's not like um, cliffhanger bait. The episodes don't end with a... I have to watch the next episode thing. It's often they're these little quiet character More, moments. The way, and I, I sort of feel like this has happened, apart from the last episode where it ends with the, I know who killed Laura Palmer. Mm. I like how it ends on a very low, not a low note, as a, a quiet note. Well, it, the, the, most episodes end on a vibe. A vibe. A vibe. But it's all about the vibe. But it is. It is all about the vibe. I'm sorry. There's no other way of saying it. The castle is right. Yeah, yeah. It's about the vibe. If this show was made now, it would be different. You know, I mean, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that the the attempt to... What it shows me is confidence. It's not like we have to trick you into wanting to come back and watch this because you've had 40 minutes of nothing happening. Yeah. And then two minutes of, yeah. you know, what's in the box? That just shows a, a confidence in... The show's own sense of its, you know, authorial control and the filmmaking. So I think it's nice when it ends on those quiet moments. And there are some episodes that end on cliffhangers, but when they do, they're more kind of just because they wanted to take the piece out of cliffhangers mm. th- than actually having something that you really want to get the resolution for. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, like I mean, in, the, in the, the final episode of season one, there's like nearly every single scene is a cliffhanger. It's like ridiculous mm. to the point where at the beginning of the next episode, um, you know, Cooper's like, what did I miss? And like, or um, Lucy lists off hundreds of things and he's like, God, how long have I been unconscious? Yeah. And she's like, Oh, four hours. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, Oh, all right. Okay. That makes no sense. And there's another, there's another one and a scene where, and this connects to this episode because of the invitation to love where um, Truman walks up to, uh, Lucy and she's watching TV and he's like what um, what's happened mm. and she's like well 
Chet shut Montana. Montana survived. And then she lists all these things mm. off from invitation to love. And he's like, no, no, what's happened here? And it's almost as though he's saying, no, no, what's happened on this show? Yeah. You know, yeah. so, and I think that, that a lot of those meta textual elements are really present in this episode as well. Mm. So, um, any final thoughts before we move on, huh? Oh, uh, no, just uh, bloody loved it. All right, then. While you look at the details of the next episode, I will just do a quick bit of housekeeping. A reminder that we appreciate feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com or comments on the YouTube channel are equally applicable. And if you could interact with us on social media, that would be splendid. You can do that on Twitter and on Instagram, where in both cases we are at rewatchproj. Check out our friend shows and reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify are also appreciated. So what are we talking about next time, Hannah? Uh, the next episode is called The One-Armed Man. Mm. Uh, synopsis is Cooper questions Dr. Jacoby, who suspects Leah Johnson is the killer. Gordon Cole, Cooper's supervisor, calls in with Albert's report. Josie Packard spies on Ben Horn and Catherine Martell. Hawk tracks down The One-Armed Man. He's a great tracker, that Hawk. It's directed by Tim Hunter and written by Robert Engels. All righty. The gang's all here. Okay, so we will be doing that soon. So we will speak to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Take care.